Okay, this is uh, Dr. McDougall quotes, part number eight. Um, they're from this book, uh, John McDougall, the doctor who fought from you. They're not in the same order in the book. Uh, they're sort of like all the quotes from the book that I collected and put them in here. Also, I'd appreciate it if you want to do something nice for the channel is to, to write a review of the book based on all the videos you've seen me do. Um, they're, again, they're not exactly the same as the book, but they're quite similar. Okay, um, McDougall's got a lot of good quotes, so here we go, Ron. This is part eight of Dr. McDougall quotes here. Let me just try to hide this thing. All right, so first one is, since the beginning of humans on Earth, most populations were land-bound and did not eat fish. Okay, so where he's coming from is this whole push, oh, you need more omega-3s, you need more omega-3s, and you need to take fish oil or algae oil. It's all nonsense. You don't. Okay, there's plenty of omega-3s just in regular plant foods. That's where the fish gets them, from eating plants. You eat the plants, you'll get plenty of them. I've got separate lectures on all that stuff. For humans, our need for fat is very minimal. And that's based, you know, Nathan Pritikin had reviewed all the dietary uh, fat studies many, many years ago. And he saw there were studies where they fed people less than 1% fat, 0.75% of calories from fat, and it was omega-6 fats that they fed them. And the patients did very well. And there's other similar studies. People really don't need much fat. Okay, so that's why... It's impossible with any naturally chosen diet to be too low in fat. It's also impossible to be too low in protein. You need to forget about those things. All the stuff about good fats, it's a bunch of nonsense to trick the pearls into buying stuff. The stuff about needing more protein, sarcopene, it's all BS. Um, I try to help the pearls because you have to understand, no one cares about you. As a matter of fact, that's one of the most common reasons I think that the pearls screw up. You know, they say things like, well, I have a good doctor and I go to my doctor. Your doctor might mean very well and be very knowledgeable in their field, but hardly any doctors know nutrition. Less than 1%. It's more like one out of a thousand, if that many, okay? So statistically, the odds that your doctor knows that they're talking about nutrition are quite low. Unless they're a low-fat, low-sodium vegan <laughs> with no oil, they don't know what they're talking about, okay? All right, um... Dr. McDougall continues, happiness comes from helping other people. And that's true. I think we get release or reward neurotransmitters in our brain when we help other people because biologically, evolu evolutionarily, it was good for our survival that we're getting along with other people because humans do a lot better when they have some type of social support system than being on their own. So when we help other people, we not only help them, and we feel better ourselves, and psychologically, it's a good thing, and we maintain social contacts, etc. Okay, patients with rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis often show improvement within one week. So as soon as they sort of get the bad food out of the gut, the good food starts coming in. It starts supplying nutrition to the good bacteria. So basically, you only have to think about yourself as having two types of gut bacteria. The bad bacteria, they don't care about us. They're eating the processed food and the re residues of the processed food and the meat and the oils. The good bacteria, they want the fiber, okay? So they're fed the fiber, they convert it to short-chain fatty acids. Those short-chain fatty acids are made into butyrate, for example. The butyrate goes to the intestinal lining cells, the enterocytes. It's used to make tight junctions. It also travels in the blood to the brain. It's used to make the blood-brain barrier. And by keeping that gut barrier intact, you prevent leaky gut, and then you prevent most of these autoimmune diseases, the vast majority of them. So that's what that's all about. Um, he says, usually you'll know within a week if you're getting better. Sometimes it'll take a longer amount of time. If you're not getting better by four months, then you're probably not going to get better. And you might have to do something more advanced than that, like go through what he calls an elimination diet. Make sure you're not gluten sensitive, for example. And he has a whole stepwise elimination diet where you eliminate subsequent foods that people are potentially allergic to or that seem related to autoimmune diseases. And other things I think you got to watch out for, like you don't want to be eating you know, GMO corn, okay? Because the GP, I think that potentially, based on my study of it, could contribute to autoimmune. You don't want F- in your water. I would filter your water. That, in my reading of it, could potentially contribute to autoimmune. There's a few other things, too, like that you should be aware of. I wouldn't have any omega-6 cooking oils, for example. I have a whole list of everything in a separate talk on what uh, causes leaky gut. Okay, Dr. McDougall continues. Coffee is not a health food. It is best to avoid it. Coffee does all kinds of bad things you don't. Everybody says, oh, stress is bad. Then coffee mimics it with raising the exact same hormones, cortisol and catecholamines. Why would you want to do that? Dr. McDougall has lectures on coffee where he talks about the different subtypes of it and you know how it's worse if you don't at least filter it, but still... There's so many problems with it, I would just avoid it. Unless, you know, I had to, like, drive when I was sleepy, then you would then you would want it. But other than that, the, the negatives outweigh the benefits. Okay, Dr. McDougall continues. People love to hear good things about their bad habits. Yes. Um, the Atkins diet is the make-yourself-sick diet. 
The Kempner diet is the diet for the nearly dead. The McDougall diet is the diet for the living. Okay, yeah, that's basically true. <laughs> Kempner diet, you get constipated, you go into ketosis, you make yourself sick. Kempner diet can save people's lives when they're in kidney failure and when they got severe hypertension in the 200s, but it's boring to eat, you know, plain white rice every day that much. Even though a lot of the Asians used to eat 90% of their calories from white rice and they were very healthy. Okay, the McDougal diet is easy to sustain for life. My version of it, the Spartan vegan diet, it's a little more strict, but it's it's pretty much very similar. Okay, um, McDougal continues. The most common reason people fail when they try to eat a vegan diet is because they don't eat enough starch or because they continue to eat oils. Some people who try to satisfy hunger with vegetables fail and they sometimes go back to eating meat. So what I would say is I agree with McDougal. What he says is you have to just go low-fat, starch-based vegan. Just try it for a month or two or three and see how it goes. You know, recheck your total cholesterol, recheck your body weight. But what I'm getting at is he tells people you need starch to satisfy your hunger and you have to satisfy your hunger or you won't be able to sustain the diet for the rest of your life. It's a lifetime thing, okay? So starch is what satisfies your hunger. You need to know that. Then the other thing is you want to quit oil 100% because, you know, the average person, they don't get it. They think, oh, I'm doing okay because I'm not as fat as my cousin. I'm not as fat as the other fat, stupid people over here. That's not the way to think. The way to think is what's the best I could do and aim for that. Then you got a chance to do pretty well and to really make progress. Because what the typical person I see is they say, well, I'm cutting down on oil. I'm cutting down on meat. And I think that's a big mistake. You stop eating meat. You stop eating oil. Just try it for a couple of months. Try it for two months. See what happens to your total cholesterol, your body weight, and your other tests, if any of them are abnormal. And you'll be surprised what kind of progress you make. Because that big change leads to a big benefit. These little tiny changes, well, I'm cutting down on oil, I'm cutting down on meat, they usually don't make much difference. Those are the kind of people who I talk to them. And then six months later, a year later, you know, they're in kidney failure. You know, they got their foot amputated from their diabetes. They had another myocardial infarction. They're just mediocre. That's not, you don't want to be half ass. okay? This is your life. And there's no expectation that you're going to do well. I can tell you, most patients do not do well. The vast majority, the vast, vast, vast majority of patients that I see have bad outcomes because they don't change their diet. They take a bunch of pills, they go for surgery. Pills and surgeries don't change things. They don't fix the underlying problem. You have to fix a diet. You can't cure a dietary disease with a pill. That never happens, okay? You can't cure a dietary disease with a surgery. Yeah, you can do bariatric surgery of the stomach, you know, and lose 100 pounds or something. But even there, look at the lectures of Garth Davis. They got to change their diet or otherwise they tend to drift back into morbid, severe obesity. You know, it's sort of like... Just look around the world. All these plant-based, starch-based eaters are a bunch of skinny people that don't have you know, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, atherosclerosis. Why wouldn't you want to imitate them? It's the smart thing to do. Okay, uh, there's not enough calories in vegetables to satisfy your hunger, so that's not going to work. Dr. McDougall continues, Most chronic disease is not a mystery. It is caused by eating the wrong food. Fix the food and you fix 80% of medical problems. That's a big statement. Fix the food and you fix 80% of medical problems. And I think that's an also a big, a big statement there too. What he's talking about in a sense is a holistic approach to health. What conventional medicine tends to do is it says, this is disease number one, take this pill. This is disease number two, take this pill. Disease number three, take this pill. Disease number four, take this pill. What they don't tell you is each pill is a metabolic poison to poison some metabolic system typically. <laughs> And what I'm saying is you're not going to poison your way to health, all right? What you want to do is just optimize diet for the entire body. The species-specific diet, the optimal ones, a low-fat, low-sodium, vegan diet, whole food, starch-based, okay? And fruits are also quite good. I don't want to get into all the fruit stuff now, but, and no oils. Oils is a processed food. It's not a naturally occurring food. So anyways, when you do that, then you get increased blood flow to all your tissues and they tend to work better. Then you avoid all the toxins in meat and oils and you tend to feel better. Then you get all the potassium you're supposed to get, all the magnesium you're supposed to get, all the antioxidants you're supposed to get, all the fiber you're supposed to get, and everything just starts working better. That's why it's more intelligent to say, how can I be as healthy as possible? Because in so doing, you tend to fix all these minor problems all over the place. You often will fix neuropathies. You'll often fix back pain and a lot of musculoskeletal aches. You'll often sleep better, etc. Your mood will often calm down. You'll be less anxious. So why wouldn't you want to do that? Okay. 
Uh, but that's why it'll seem so different because you're used to somebody saying this is the pill for disease one, pill for disease two, and acting like that's all scientific when actually it's, it's sort of primitive and doesn't work so well. What really works is what is the species-specific diet? What do healthy people eat? I shall imitate them. That's actually intelligent. Okay, and in a sense, I think pills are kind of, a, you know, medicine for animals. And what I'm saying is you could take the stupid animal and just give it a pill, okay? The animal can take the pill. But could the animal voluntarily change its diet, get its sleep, exercise every day? No, it, it doesn't have internal volition to make its own decisions, whereas an intelligent person does. Why not use your brain, fix the problem for free with no side effects and cure yourself rather than take pills for years that don't work and just progressively deteriorate and become fat, sick, and stupid like most people in their late 50s, early 60s and have zero chance of getting better. Why would you want to do that? That's just stupid. What the average person does is stupid. What conventional medicine recommends is stupid. It never works. The cure rate for treating diabetes, hypertension, obesity, atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease with a pill, it's zero, zero percent success. Whereas with a low-fat vegan, you catch a type 2 diabetic within four years, Roy Taylor's experience, close to 100% success. Same thing with Esselstyn for coronary artery disease. McDougall says for type 2 diabetes. Okay, we talked we talk about it for diabetes, and most people who eat the low-fat vegan diet, there's no such thing as a fat person like in China before 1975 when they ate all the rice and other similar countries. Rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes are all 1% of calories from fat. The lower the percentage, the number, or the percentage of calories from fat, the skinnier the population is. So why wouldn't you take the path that works and people also say, where is a randomized control uh, trial? Well, I'll tell you, you're not going to do a randomized control trial for diet, but you can just look at populations. You know, what more do you want? You want a big sample size? A billion out of a billion rice eaters, they're skinny, okay? Potato eaters, they're skinny. Sweet potato eaters, they're skinny. Like Dr. McDougall used to say, you can see the truth. You can see it. There it is. Okay, Dr. McDougall continues, the key to longevity is to increase carbohydrate intake and to decrease the intake of protein and fat. Yeah, basically, when you eat a starch, a starch means a polymer of glucose wrapped in fiber, okay? And whenever you increase your intake of carbohydrate, you're going to decrease your intake of protein and fat. When you avoid animal foods and oils, you decrease your intake of protein and fat, okay? So that's, that's why this diet works. Okay, Dr. McDougall continues, you want to lower your insulin-like growth factor. Increased insulin-like growth factor makes you look older and die sooner. Yeah, because in increased insulin-like growth factor is also one of the activators of mTOR. mTOR means mechanistic target arapamycin, sometimes called um, an mammalian target arapamycin. And the gist of it is it's a nutrient-sensing pathway. It's like a contractor getting ready to build a building. The contractor says, give me all my building materials, then I'll start to build. And so what mTOR is waiting for is a nutrient-sensing pathway. It needs to have certain things. Most commonly, a rate-limiting step will be something like leucine and methionine, the amino acids from animal foods, but it also needs iron. It also needs some lipids. It also likes insulin-like growth factor to be elevated. All of those things are a signal that all the building materials are available, food resources are abundant. Now's a good time to have the cell replicate. So if you're 20 years old and a bodybuilder trying to get big muscles fast, you like insulin-like growth factor and these other things to be high, branched-chain amino acids like leucine. On the other hand, if you're over 30, you don't want to accelerate your aging, you know. You don't want to accelerate cell replication and potentially speed up the growth of a cancer. Okay, I'm to, uh, what, what Hayflick Limit's all about is a somatic body cell, a non-stem cell, has only about 60 divisions, 60 cell divisions, so six, zero, 60 cell divisions. The more rapidly those cells divide, the more rapidly they reach the Hayflick Limit, whereby the... Uh, DNA polymerase, it can't attach to the far end of the chromosome. So the chromosome keeps shortening with every cell replication. Eventually, it shortens into genes that it needs to survive those cells. So they go into senescence and they die. Okay, so you don't want to accelerate your, rel your rate of cell replication for no reason. So you don't want to accelerate mTOR. You don't want early arrival at the Hayflick limit. All right, Dr. McDougall continues. Dairy, meat, and oil cause leaky gut and autoimmune arthritis. Vegetable oil is toxic to the intestinal lining. It's all bad. Why would you want something toxic to your intestinal lining? It causes insulin resistance, predisposing you to diabetes. It predisposes you to atherosclerosis, to leaky gut, to autoimmune disease, to <laughs> hypertension causing blood slots. There's nothing good about it. I'm stupid. Okay, and all this nonsense promoting fish oil and olive oil. It's all for chumps. you got to remember... Most of the nutritional literature in the modern world, it's bogus. It's the 
the big food companies, they own the journals, they own the scientists, they only publish what makes their product look good. You can't trust it. You go back to the older stuff, that's more reliable. And a lot of times, too, you actually benefit from using your head. You know, Why would some new oil, whatever it is, come along, canola oil, be good if all the other ones are bad? No, they're all bad. Just avoid them. Don't ever eat an oil. It's not a naturally occurring food. Um, vegetable oils are powerful tumor promoters. Yeah, they cause real thick blood sludge. Even vegetable oil causes worse blood sludge than does um, the uh, saturated fat. And it's been also the case, there's a guy, I think his name is Chris Knob, the ophthalmologist. I, I had a video of his lectures and stuff earlier and when I was talking also about fats. And he showed that the strongest correlation with a lot of disease in the modern world is the increase in the amount of omega-6 fats. And now, of course, he's a little bit of a meat promoter guy, so he wants to scapegoat omega-6 fats. And then you got guys like Lustig, you know, the pediatrician from UCSF. And he's a smart guy, but he wants to promote some of these animal foods and fat foods, so he tries to scapegoat high fructose corn syrup. And yeah, there's high, those are not good foods, okay? But what I'm trying to say is just all meat has tons of problems. I made a previous video where I said, and does meat increase the risk of cancer? And there was like over 30 things that meat does that's bad, that increase the risk of cancer. Okay, Dr. McDougall continues. Chinese and Japanese women in the 1970s who ate a rice-based diet, they had almost no breast cancer. Uh, then he continues, I've never seen a single case of arsenic poisoning from rice or for any other reason. Okay, so that's it for this part eight of Dr. McDougall quotes.